from the macabre minds of Laughing Devil Production comes another story from the Nightshade Diary. You know what that means. Check under the bed and make sure no one or nothing is there. Is the closet door securely shut? Then leave your disbelief behind, amp up your imagination, and hang on tight for another ride into terror and mystery. And like all good horror stories, just imagine it's a dark and stormy night. And remember, screaming like a little girl is permitted. The following are true ghost stories from around the world. Sweden, dead voices from a haunted tape recorder. One day early in April of 1960, a burly and well-known Swedish painter named Frederick Jurgensen entered one of Stockholm's leading electronic store. It was midday lunchtime and Mr. Jurgensen asked one of the sales clerks if he could talk to the store's manager. The 60-year-old artist had brought with him a tape recorder that had been performing in a strange manner, and he wished to have it checked over for mechanical accuracy. He had purchased the device at this same electronic store some weeks before. The painter had undergone something of a struggle with himself in deciding to return the tape recorder for examination. Being an artist of some reputation, he did not want to be labeled as some kind of eccentric or nut, especially because in a few days he would be holding a one-man exhibition of his work in one of Stockholm's foremost galleries. Still, he had made a decision, and here he was. The manager will see you now, sir, the sales clerk told him. Mr. Jurgensen stepped into the manager's office and put his tape recorder on the man's desk. Is something defective with the machine? the manager asked. That's what I'd like to find out, Jurgensen replied. Actually, I have no specific complaint about its performance. In fact, it seems to be working well. Nevertheless, I'd like you to make a complete inspection of it, down to every internal connection. Whatever this costs, I'll gladly pay it. I'll be back in a week to see if you found anything wrong with the machine. What was it about the recorder's behavior that had upset the artist so? It was this. A few weeks before, he had discovered that the machine was apparently acting as a link between the living and the dead. He had bought the recorder in order to make notes and suggestions to himself about his paintings as they entered his mind. And before he forgot them, at his studio in the suburbs of Stockholm, the artist had set up the machine so that it would be ready to use when he needed it. One night, not long after, Jurgensen conceived some idea about a portrait he was painting. Here was his chance to use his new machine. He switched the tape recorder on and started to dictate his thoughts into the handheld microphone. Then he rewound the tape and started to play it back. He was dumbfounded to hear a harsh, discordant jumble of sounds interrupting his own speaking voice. Jurgensen naturally thought that the tape must be defective. So he selected a new one and ran it through the recorder to make sure that it was clear of any random recording noise. Rewinding it, he once again dictated his thoughts concerning the portrait. And again he was startled by a cacophony of sounds interfering with his own voice. This time, however, the artist was amazed to hear, through the confused jumble of sounds, several coherent voices emerging. Soon they broke out in a weird chant that echoed throughout his studio. We live! We live! We are not dead! Then the voices slowly faded out and abruptly vanished. Unrolled the tape, silent now. Jurgensen then decided that his ears must be playing tricks on him. He rewound the tape and played it again. They were the same voices, faithfully recorded and speaking to him again. In the days that followed, the painter made frequent use of the recorder, and each time the mystifying intruders broke in on his recorded thoughts with their pleading supplications. Subsequently, the artist tried everything he could think of to rule out natural explanations for the occurrences. He purchased several new tapes, but the phenomena still persisted. Gifted painter though he was, he was not a man who possessed mechanical aptitude. He once confided to a friend that he could not even repair a simple electrical fuse. 
Nevertheless, following the wiring diagram in his instruction book, he checked as best he could the components and circuitry of the machine. As far as he could see, everything appeared to be in order. It was at this point that he decided to take the recorder back to the shop for a thorough examination. When Jerkinson returned to the electronic store to pick up his machine, he was assured by the manager that it was in perfect working order. Jerkinson then began to tell a story. Since he was something of a celebrity, the newspapers picked it up and soon it was public knowledge. His tape recorder was somehow able to pick up the voices of deceased persons. Electronics experts and skeptics were quick to remind everyone that tape recorders were ideal for playing hoaxes. Audio tapes, they said, could easily be doctored and faked in all kinds of ways. As for Jurgensen, he had not bargained for all this publicity and he was confused and disturbed. Certainly, he had not wanted to create a cheap advertising stunt for the sake of his upcoming exhibition. To show his sincerity, he invited anyone who wished, scientists, engineers, psychic investigators, to examine his tape recorder and listen to the voices for themselves. As the strange occurrences gained more publicity, electronics enthusiasts and others came regularly to Jurgensen's studio. They combed his rooms for concealed equipment, monitored his recording sessions, and meticulously checked his recorder and tapes. None of them succeeded in finding trickery or fraud of any kind. Fascinated with the phenomena, Jurgensen continued with his recording. One day late in August, with ten witnesses in his studio, he picked up something very odd. It was a voice delivering a prolonged harangue in German. One of those present, a German technician, suddenly straightened up and exclaimed, That's Hitler's voice! But objected another listener, Hitler's been dead for over 15 years. Yet apparently it was true. Some recordings in a local radio station made during World War II of the Fuhrer's voice were checked against the voice on Jurgensen's tape. The speech elements matched perfectly. The voice on the artist's tape seemed to be speaking to someone in a concentration camp. It was expressing abject remorse for the atrocities committed during World War II. As the months passed, people ceased to make fun of Jurgensen and his strange tape recordings. Reporters formed the habit of visiting his studio from time to time to write up the latest eerie message recorded by his machine, and Jurgensen rarely turned them away or failed to provide them with good copy. Once, Ava Brown, Hitler's mistress, came through on the tape recorder. In a shrill whisper, she told of her last minute marriage to Hitler in the Berlin bunker just before their suicides and their final hours together. Over the next few years, Jurgensen recorded scores of tapes containing over 150 voices that could be definitely identified. Among them were those of David Lloyd George, the Emperor Napoleon, Prince Otto von Bismarck, and the executed American murderer, Carol Chessman. The Swedish artist never attempted any scientific explanation of the phenomena. Evidently, he often said, his recording device had been chosen by forces beyond his comprehension to act as a receiving station for persons no longer living on the earth plane. And as he continued to record the dead voices, he came to believe that these personalities did live on in some other happier dimension. United States, the New York Poltergeist. The disturbances that began on May 6, 1961, at the home of Mrs. Maybell Clark in New York, New Jersey, lasted only a bare two weeks. But the case has proved to be one of the best documented of poltergeist activity in recent years. The focus person was Mrs. Clark's grandson, a 13-year-old youth who at the time was living with his grandmother in her first floor four-room apartment on Rose Street. The boy's name was Ernest Rivers and the first event occurred on his 13th birthday. As Ernest was doing his homework that evening, he was amazed to see a pepper shaker come floating through the air and land gently beside him. This was the start of an almost daily barrage of flying objects, mostly crockery and glassware. When the first of the phenomena occurred, Mrs. Clark told only family members and a few of her best friends about them. 
but some of these persons eventually told others and before long word of the disturbances had leaked out when newspaper reporters began to appear to cover the ghost story she was reticent with them and refused to allow them to photograph her or Ernest. Mrs. Clark was understandably worried for two reasons. First, she didn't want people to think she and her grandson were crazy and seeing things that weren't there. Second, she was afraid she might be evicted from her apartment. Mrs. Clark had lived in this housing development for 20 years, and she did not want the housing authority to think she was an undesirable tenant or involved in some mischievous prank. One of the first persons to investigate the case was Irving Laskowitz, Director of Tenant Relations of the New York Housing Authority. After he had looked around the apartment and questioned the boy and his grandmother, he concluded, We found no evidence of manual participation. I only wish we had. Naughty children are much easier to deal with than invisible pranksters. Laskowitz then suggested that Mrs. Clark and Ernest move to a different apartment in the building. Perhaps this would end the phenomena, but Mrs. Clark bravely refused. No, she said firmly, I don't think this is going to go on forever. Well, Laskowitz replied with some humor, pretty soon you'll run out of things to break. And indeed, as the days passed, Mrs. Clark's supply of crockery and glassware was fast becoming depleted. One evening, as she and Ernest were eating in the kitchen, four cups rose out of a punch bowl in the living room sailed into the kitchen and smashed on the floor. At other times, a drinking glass became airborne from the kitchen sink, turned a corner and shattered on the living room floor. A cup was seen to glide across the pantry, shelf and smash on the kitchen floor. An ashtray hopped over a Bible on a table and landed on the carpet below. A light bulb became unscrewed from a floor lamp in Ernest's bedroom and shattered. A bottle of disinfectant toppled from the bathroom shelf and smashed two pieces on the tile floor, and once a small mirror in Ernest's bedroom fell and was cracked. By this time, news of the disturbances had roused the neighborhood, and Mrs. Clark's tenant friends, eager to help her just to witness the antics of the ghost for themselves, showed up frequently at the apartment. Often Mrs. Clark, frightened and glad to have company, let them in, in this way, several people were able to confirm that something unusual was definitely going on. One of these, Mrs. Cordelia Holland, who lived on the third floor of the complex, stated, We were in the kitchen, and suddenly I saw this glass decanter on top of the refrigerator start to move towards the edge. I yelled and caught it just in time. I put it back and made sure it was in the middle of the refrigerator top. A half hour later, when we weren't looking, we heard a crash and found the decanter on the floor. Another time, Mrs. Clark, Ernest, and two women friend were having coffee in the kitchen. Suddenly, they were amazed to see a jar of Vaseline, known to have been on the bathroom shelf, come whizzing through the pantry area, veer around a corner, and land with a thud on the living room rug. One morning, Mrs. Clark was awakened by harsh scraping noises. She saw a bottle of furniture polish inching along her bedroom floor all by itself. As the days went by, Mrs. Clark's initial fear almost left her. It was replaced by anger at having to clean up the contents of smashed bottles and pick up the broken glass. On the sixth day of the occurrences, a heavy electric steam iron rose from its position on a storage shelf in the hall and sailed into Mrs. Clark's bedroom. Its cord was trailing straight out behind it like the tail of a kite. The amazed Mrs. Clark watched as it came to rest on the floor. She later remarked that she never would have believed her eyes had she been alone, but she wasn't. Mrs. Holland was sitting with her in the bedroom and saw it too. A few days later, James Moore, a New York Housing Authority executive, and Ward Ulrich, a New York Star Lodger reporter, were both in the Clark apartment. Ulrich was standing in a hallway when he heard someone give a low wail. He whirled around just in time to see a bottle zip through the air and land in Mrs. Clark's bedroom. Ulrich picked it up and both men saw that it was a medicine bottle with a plastic cap. It had been resting on one of the hall shelves before it became airborne. During this event, Ernest was seen to be standing just inside his own room. 
Later, Ulrich said he doubted that the boy could have thrown the bottle from where he was standing. Ulrich closely questioned Mrs. Clark, Ernest, and other witnesses about the odd events. They were all convinced that what they had seen were real happenings and that no trickery was involved. These witnesses, Ulrich said, were all rational and normally intelligent people. None of them seemed emotional or hysterical. Actually, far greater hysteria was shown by the crowds who often gathered outside the apartment building, eager to get a look at the ghost house. Frequently, there were drunken adults and noisy children among them. In time, Mrs. Clark and Ernest grew more frightened of them than of the spooks in their apartment. On some nights, the boy and his grandmother sought escape from the poltergeist at the home of Mrs. Clark's daughter and her husband, Ruth and William Hargood. At such times, no poltergeist activity occurred. By this time, psychic researchers had become interested in the case, and when interviewed by reporters, the theory of emotionally upset youngsters possibly causing the disturbances came to the fore. Naturally, this caused suspicion to fall on young Ernest. One paper began calling him the boy who makes things fly. In Ernest's case, there were good grounds for the theory for in his young life the boy had suffered a great deal of unhappiness and emotional upset. In 1956, Ernest's mother, Ann Clark Rivers, had killed his father, a professional boxer. During her trial, she testified that on that night she had dreamed her husband was going to kill her with a gun he kept in the bedroom. Badly frightened and before she was fully awake, Ann Rivers had obtained the gun and killed her husband. She pleaded guilty to a charge of manslaughter in the second degree and was sentenced from 18 to 22 years in a minimum security reformatory for women. After this, Ernest was sent to live with his grandparents in a Newark apartment house. Then in 1960, his grandfather died. The following year in April, he and his grandmother learned that Ernest's mother had escaped from the reformatory. Although she was later apprehended and returned, Ann Rivers was still at large when the poltergeist activity took place in Mrs. Clark's Newark apartment. If the disturbed teenager theory is correct, it is likely that Ann Rivers' escape triggered Ernest's intense emotional state and perhaps set the stage for the disturbances that occurred a month later. In any case, by mid-May, Mrs. Clark's apartment was besieged by well-meaning visitors who wanted to investigate the phenomena, help in any way they could, or catch a glimpse of that boy who makes things flies. Two Rutgers University researchers arrived who wanted to test Ernest for PK ability, but Mrs. Clark refused the offer. Another man came who had years of experience in exercising poltergeist. Despite his efforts, he failed. For that same night, two more events took place. A bottle of antiseptic flew out of the bathroom, medicine cabinet, and landed in Mrs. Clark's bedroom. Then a can of paint on a shelf in the hall was flung to the floor. At this point, a New York University professor of psychology named Dr. Charles Werg entered the picture. Dr. Werg had long been interested in poltergeist events, and he visited the Clark apartment a number of times. He quickly gained the confidence of Mrs. Clark and Ernest. On three separate occasions, while in the apartment with Ernest, Dr. Werg saw objects in flight, propelled by an unseen force, but he declared that the boy was not standing in the right places to have thrown the objects. Werg measured distances and checked every object in the room to make sure no pranks were being played. Soon, he was convinced that Ernest had done nothing overly physical to move the objects. Then came the evening of May 13. Outside the apartment, the crowd of people were especially restless and noisy. Once in a while, someone would knock loudly on the door and demand to see the boy that makes things fly. Around 10 o'clock, William Hargood showed up to make, take his mother-in-law and Ernest home with him. That was when those present saw a glass ashtray snap in two with a loud report. Seeing this, Mrs. Clark 
put in a quick call to Dr. Ward because she promised to let him know of the next poltergeist event. When the professor arrived, he saw that Ernest and his grandmother were going to leave with William Hargwood. Couldn't you leave the boy here with me? he requested. Maybe there'll be another manifestation when we're alone in the apartment together. The frightened Mrs. Clark finally agreed to this and left with her son-in-law. Ernest and the professor settled down to see what, if anything, would occur next. Their wait was a short one. Both were in the kitchen when they heard a loud crash in the living room. In they dashed to find a table lamp hurled to the floor. Word was sure Ernest hadn't overturned the lamp because the boy had been right next to him in the kitchen. Even so, he checked the smashed lamp and its plug and cord to see whether any strings or other apparatus had been rigged up to pull it over, but he turned up nothing. About ten minutes after this event, Ernest and Reg were back in the kitchen standing a few feet away from the drain board on the sink. Suddenly, a glass standing on the board rose into the air and dashed the fragments on the floor. The curious thing about the event was that they both saw the glass shatter before it hit the floor. Next, Dr. Rugg and Ernest heard a crash and the sound of breaking glass from Mrs. Clark's bedroom. Here they found that a perfectly natural physical event had taken place. Someone in the milling noisy crowd outside had flung a rock through the window. By now, Ernest was nearly frightened out of his wist, not so much by the poltergeist activity as by the dangerous, ugly mob outside. At this point, Dr. Rugg phoned the police and William Hargwood who arrived in short order. The police took a look around the apartment to try to find out what was causing the strange events, but could find nothing amiss. Then they dispersed the crowds outside and left. As the two men and the boy were getting ready to leave the apartment, a pepper shaker suddenly hit Ernest's Uncle William on the back, then fell to the floor. Seconds later, glass ashtray grazed his chin. Hargwood was not in the least hurt by these blows, however. The ashtray was replaced on a table, but a minute later fell of its own accord directly between the two men. Later, Dr. Rugg admitted that at this time he did not have the boy under close observation, but his belief was that Ernest did not throw these objects or try to displace them. The next event turned out to be the final one of the case. Thoroughly scared by now, Ernest was standing in the hallway, ready to leave through the front door. Reg and Hargwood were still in the living room. At this time, Dr. Reg saw a salt shaker come sailing in from the kitchen, which was opposite the hall where Ernest was waiting at the front door. It struck Hargwood on the head. Again, surprisingly, he was not hurt by the blow. This time, Dr. Reg could say with certainty that the boy could not possibly have thrown the object. In any case, Reg, Ernest, and his uncle William lost no time and escaping to the Hargwood home. For some weeks, the boy stayed with his uncle and aunt. When he finally did return to the apartment to live with his grandmother, the poltergeist activity did not resume. So ended the Newark poltergeist affair. The case is particularly noteworthy because it was the first to be reported from a housing development. The activity, which consisted of over 50 separate events, centered around one small apartment in a large building complex. That Ernest was the focus person cannot be doubted, for there was never any poltergeist activity when he was not present in the apartment. And in all probability, if the PK theory is correct, the objects involved were made to move by the psychokinetic energy unconsciously released by the emotionally upset adolescent boy. From the United States, Popper, the Long Island Poltergeist. Not many children have been welcomed home from school with a five-gun salute, but when the Herman children, 12-year-old James Jr. and 13-year-old Lucille, walked in the front door of their Long Island, New York home at 3.30 on the afternoon of February 3, 1958, things began going crazy. It was here in this quiet suburban home that one of the best known of all poltergeist cases took place. The disturbances lasted a little over a month and as tabulated by a parapsychologist consisted of 67 separate documented events. 
when the children returned home from school that afternoon. Jimmy went upstairs to his room and found that a ceramic doll and a ship model of his had been smashed. Baffled, the boy reported this damage to his mother, who then looked around in other rooms to see if anything else had been disturbed. On her own dresser, she discovered that a bottle of holy water had been knocked over. The Hermans were Roman Catholics. Its cap was unscrewed and the water was dripping down on the floor. At this point, no noises had been heard. But during the next 45 minutes, a series of poppings was heard in various parts of the house. The loud noises sounded like so many bottles of champagne being uncorked. Scurrying from room to room, Mrs. Herman and her two children found that the caps to numerous bottles, most of which contained cosmetics, soft drinks, and cleaning agents, had become unscrewed and the bottles were lying on their sides, pouring out their contents. While Jimmy and his mother were in the cellar, they saw a half-gallon bottle of bleach rise from a cardboard box and come sailing towards them. It smashed almost at Mrs. Herman's feet. Jimmy had the presence of mind to pull some clothing on a clothesline in front of her so that she would be protected from the flying glass and splashing bleach. When the disturbances had apparently ceased for the time being, an unnerved Mrs. Herman got on the phone to her husband, an Air France representative working in New York City. In a hushed voice, she reported to James Herman Sr., the loud popping noises, the unscrewed bottles, and the spilled liquids. Herman asked if anyone had been hurt. When his wife said no, Herman, though puzzled, saw no reason to leave work early. Later on the commuter train, he pondered these odd explosions. He concluded that some chemical reaction must have taken place in the bottles, nearly simultaneously, causing them all to pop open in a short space of time. Maybe, he speculated some atmospheric condition in the house, such as excess humidity or the heating turned up too high, had triggered the explosion. But when he arrived home and inspected the burst bottles, he was thoroughly perplexed. All the bottles had screw-type caps that required several turns before they could be removed. If they had been simple crimped caps such as those on soft drink bottles, his theory might have been correct. At any rate, the family by now had composed themselves, and Herman decided to forget about the mystery. But this was just the beginning of the weird events in the Herman household. Three days later, Lucille and Jimmy came home from school as usual, and the popping noises were heard again. In the bathroom, two bottles of rubbing alcohol and one of nail polish were found, minus their caps tipped over and spilling their contents. A wine bottle in the linen closet was overturned and gurgling its liquid out over sheets and towels. Again, in the basement, a bottle of Clorox was seen to spring out of its box and smash on the cement floor. The next night, young Jimmy was the only person at home when the cap on an ammonia bottle under the kitchen sink became unscrewed and the liquid dumped all over. When his father learned of this, he began to suspect that perhaps his son was the cause of it all. Jimmy was a bright, imaginative boy who was much interested in science at school. It was entirely possible, Herman speculated, that the boy might be attempting to work out a series of bizarre experiments for the fun of it at the expense of his family. He might even have figured out how to slip some chemical into the bottles before he went to school so timing and poppings that they could occur later. Herman had a week weekend coming up and he decided to spend it keeping tabs on Jimmy's activities. No poppings occurred on Saturday, but Sunday, February the 9th, was a banner day at the Herman's house. The father had been watching Jimmy closely, but by the time the whole family gathered in the living room, a little after 10 o'clock in the morning, Herman still had not seen the boy doing anything suspicious. Thus he was surprised when odd noises were heard coming from various rooms. Checking through the house, he found another bottle of holy water, uncapped and spilling in the parents' bedroom. A bottle of toilet water had fallen, having lost its screw cap and rubber stopper. In the bathroom, a bottle of shampoo and one of kaopectate 
had been unscrewed, fallen over, and were emptying out their contents. In the cellar, a can of paint thinner had opened and was spilling. Checking on all these events had taken about a quarter of an hour, and it was now about 10.30. At this time, Herman noted Jimmy had gone into the bathroom and was brushing his teeth. Still not convinced that his son was completely innocent, he confronted him at the doorway of the bathroom and began questioning him. Jimmy protested vigorously that he had had nothing to do with the bottle poppings. Between father and son, on a formica vanity table, stood the same two bottles of shampoo and keopectate that had spilled a few minutes before. Mrs. Herman had put them there after she cleaned up the mess. Suddenly Herman and Jimmy were astonished to see both bottles begin to move, but in opposite directions. The shampoo toppled off the table and crashed on the tile floor. The keopectate simply slid along the vanity until it fell into the sink before which Jimmy was standing. It was this event, witnessed by himself and his son, that convinced James Herman that something unique was going on in his home. This is too much, he recalled, saying later. We've got troubles. Herman went directly to the phone and called the Nassau County Police Department. The desk sergeant listened patiently to what sounded like a wild tale of bottles popping their caps and flying about rooms. In fact, he accused Herman of having been drinking. Herman protested he hadn't. The sergeant relented and said he was sending an officer to investigate. Accordingly, patrolman James Hughes soon arrived on the scene. He was sitting in the living room trying to absorb the strange stories the family was blurting out to him when a noise was heard in the bathroom. As it happened, Hughes had checked the bathroom upon its arrival and nothing had been amiss there. Once again, Mrs. Herman had put all to rights, including the keopectate bottle on the vanity. Rushing into the bathroom, Hughes and the others saw that the keopectate container had been overturned. Hughes was certain he had seen it standing upright. I can swear to that, he later wrote in his official report. When Hughes reported back to Detective Joseph Tazi, the latter listened skeptically. He strongly suspected that some person or persons were responsible for the happenings. In any event, he wanted to see for himself, so he took official charge of the case the following Tuesday, February 11th. That afternoon, when he, Mrs. Herman, Lucille, and Jimmy were in the house, an atomizer bottle of perfume on the teenage girl's dresser was found tipped over its cap off and the scent spilled. A noise had been heard when this event occurred, and Tazi noted that nobody had been in the girl's room at the time. In the cellar, it was found that the paint thinner had again lost its cap and was spilled. The next day, Tazi had a serious talk with the Herman children. He frankly believed that one of them was responsible for the occurrences. But Jimmy and Lucille still claimed they had nothing to do with the strange events. For the next few days, the poltergeist events were confined to mere overturnings of the holy water bottle in the parents' bedroom. But with a difference this time. The water was found to be quite warm to the touch. However, on the evening of February 15, the activity took a more exciting turn. While Mr. and Mrs. Herman were in other parts of the house, Lucille, Jimmy, and their Aunt Marie were watching television. Suddenly they saw a porcelain figurine on the coffee table rise up and begin to float through the air. Moments later it crashed down, unbroken on the carpet. The strange thing was that even though it hit a soft surface, it made an unusually loud noise. More events took place the next Sunday. Mrs. Herman found her perfume bottle overturned and spilling on her dresser. Later, after the children had gone to bed, the parents heard a noise in Jimmy's bedroom. They found that a small plastic angel had been transported across his room to the dresser, where it knocked down a Davy Crockett doll and a ship model. A few minutes later, while Herman was on the phone reporting all this to Tazi, he and his wife heard another loud noise from Jimmy's room. A globe of the world had been dashed to the floor. Several minutes later, another crash was heard in Jimmy's room. They found the night table lamp on the floor with its bulb smashed. This was enough for Herman. He picked up his terrified son, carried him into the master bedroom, and put him to bed there. But the transfer did little to check the poltergeist antics.
Half an hour later, the night table in the master bedroom overturned with a loud crash. By this time, it was becoming clear to everybody that the disturbances were centering around Jimmy, and both Tazi and Herman once again began to suspect that the boy was in some mysterious way responsible for them. Only two events occurred during the first part of the next week. On Monday evening, Mrs. Herman found the same porcelain figurine on the floor in the living room, two feet from the coffee table it had stood on. On Wednesday, she heard a noise in the living room. Again, the figurine had fallen, as it had on Monday. All this while Tazi had been bending over backward to discover some physical cause for the happenings. Thinking they might be caused by a high-frequency radio waves, Tazi had his men question a resident in the area who was a ham radio operator. It turned out this man hadn't used his set in years. Tazi then contacted the Long Island Lighting Company, and an oscillograph was installed in the cellar of the Herman home to pick up any unusual vibrations. None were picked up, even while the occurrences were happening. The police lab in Mineola was given five of the bottles that had lost their caps for analysis. None was found to contain any foreign matter other than their normal contents. The lighting company was summoned again to examine the house's wiring, fuse panels, and ground cables for faulty electrical emissions. Everything was found to be in order. Early on Thursday, February 20th, a loud pop was heard in the basement. Lucille found another Clorox bottle had lost its cap and was spilling. At 8 o'clock that same night, when the whole family, including Tazi, was either in the dining room or basement, a very loud smashing noise was heard in the living room. A porcelain figure had left a table and hit the wooden desk about 10 feet away. The impact had broken the figurine's arm and left a dent in the wood. Ninety minutes later, Jimmy, Lucille, Mrs. Herman, and Tazi were in the dining room area when a sugar bowl on the dining room table suddenly took off and smashed close to Tazi's feet. A few minutes after this, an ink bottle on the same table lost its screw cap and sailed towards the front door, then suddenly dropped and splashed ink on the floor. Two more incidents happened that same night. A figurine in the living room was found smashed against a desk and completely demolished, and a toy metal horse fell at Tazi's feet while he and Jimmy were in the basement. At this point, the frustrated Tazi overreacted and subjected Jimmy to stern questioning, even accusing him of having thrown the toy horse. All the while, the boy stoutly denied being the cause of any of the disturbances. That same day, the meticulous Tazi had checked all the electrical outlets, the TV, and the oil burner to see if they were possibly causing the phenomena, but they were all in good order. In addition, he looked at the water leaders, fuse boxes, and the electrical connections in the attic. Nothing seemed wrong with them. After the unnerving events of February 20th, the Hermans decided to vacate the house for a couple of days and stay with relatives. Tazi took this opportunity to spend a night alone in the house, but nothing at all of a supernatural nature occurred. When the Hermans returned on Sunday afternoon, the poltergeist activity recommenced with a vengeance. About three o'clock, a heavy, class-cut centerpiece rose from the dining room table and landed on the bottom shelf of a cabinet several feet away. A little after eight in the evening, a figurine on the end table, the same one seen by Aunt Marie a few days before, was heard to smash against a desk that was a dozen feet away. A newspaper reporter from Newsday was present and witnessed this event. At 8.30, when Mrs. Herman and the children were in their rooms, Mr. Herman and the reporter were rocked by a loud thud that shook the whole house. The heavy dresser in Jimmy's room had toppled over. By this time, news of the baffling events in the Herman household had appeared in the papers and other media. To the Hermans, this unwanted publicity was in its way more of a nuisance than the strange events themselves. As the media gave the story more and more play, crackpot letters began to fill the family mailbox. Crude scrawls exhorted the Hermans to take heart against Satan. Some even condemned them for having committed unprintable sins, which were the cause of their trouble. Once or twice, self-styled preachers of obscure gospel sects showed up and conducted rites of exorcism on the front lawn. 
In the meanwhile, disturbances at the house were still in full swing. On Monday afternoon, a terrific crash in Jimmy's room was heard, and again the heavy dresser was found on its side. Lucille in the basement at the time remarked later, It sounded like the walls were caving in. In the newspapers and over radio and TV, the mysterious force had come to be called Popper because of the many bottle-popping incidents. That same Monday night, more fireworks were scheduled by Popper. At 8.30, when no one was in the living room, a noise was heard there. A ceramic ashtray that had reposed on the coffee table was found and shattered some four feet away. About 30 minutes later, Jimmy's globe of the world came bouncing out of his room, narrowly missing the reporter who was seated in the living room. Next, just a couple of minutes after James Herman returned home from work, a terrific blow was heard in Jimmy's room. Everyone rushed in and saw that the poltergeist had worked its mightiest feat to date. A heavy bookcase was found wedged upside down between the radiator and the bed. Later, a picture hanging over Jimmy's bed was discovered on the floor in the middle of the room. The following morning after Herman had left for work and while the children were dressing for school, a loud crash was heard, and Mrs. Herman dashed into the hall. She called to the children. Both answered that it was not in their room. By this time, the children had been sternly instructed not to move from where they were when some disturbance occurred. Then everyone went into the master bedroom and found that a 16-inch plaster figure of the Virgin Mary had left James Herman's dresser and crashed to the floor several feet away. In its flight, it had knocked over a picture, scarred the mirror frame, and knocked over a lamp. That evening around 6, Jimmy was in the rumpus room section of the basement doing his homework when a loud crash and a yell from Jimmy brought the family and the reporter on the run. In perhaps the most dramatic feat so far, the children's phonograph, which had been standing on a table by one wall, had sailed across the basement, hit the stairway, and crashed to the cement floor with its case broken. Ninety minutes later, while the reporter, a policeman, and one of two parapsychologists who had come to study the case were in the basement examining the broken phonograph, a loud noise was heard in the master bedroom. Mrs. Herman's night lamp was found overturned on her dresser. Next, Jimmy rushed in to report that a plate of bread standing on the dining room table had fallen to the floor. Although Jimmy had been sitting at the table alone, he had not seen the plate actually fall, but had only heard the crash. Nevertheless, since the boy had been alone during both this and the phonograph event, suspicion began to refocus on him as the perpetrator. Then, oddly, all major disturbances abruptly ceased for three days. Even so, Tazi and his associates still pressed for a physical solution to the case. On the day of the bread plate event, the fire department had checked a well on the front lawn on the theory that changes in the water tables below ground might have something to do with Popper's activity. Yet no change was found over the last five years. A report from the town engineer revealed that no underground streams were present. An RCA test truck checked for unusual radio frequencies outside the house. None was discovered. A town inspector had been over every inch of the house and found it structurally sound. The plumbing was checked for unusual vibrations and slight ones were found but one of the neighbor's houses had them too, much louder ones, yet it had no poltergeist. Early in March, nearby Mitchell Air Force Base was asked for a list of departure times of jet aircraft to see whether any correlation can be found between takeoffs and the disturbances. None could. Then, on March 2nd, a Sunday, fresh incidents broke out in the afternoon and evening. At this time, the Hermans had some friends and relatives in the house. One of these saw the glass centerpiece rise from the dining room table and fall to the floor. Later, James Herman's bedroom's lamp was found overturned. At 7.30, Jimmy, his father, and then uncle went to the store. When they returned, they found the boy's globe of the world in the middle of his bed. One local newspaper had implied that Jimmy could have caused all the events himself. 
and once that evening James Herman flatly accused his son again, urging him to admit his guilt without further delay. Driven to tears, Jimmy pleaded, Dad, I had nothing to do with any of it. Hearing her brother cry, Lucille too burst into tears, and so did their mother. Everyone in the house was now living on raw nerve, just waiting for the next calamity. After the children were put to bed, more things happened in the unhappy household. Loud crashes from Jimmy's room revealed that the picture over his bed had fallen again. Later, another crash brought Herman on the run to his son's room. This time, flashlight in hand, he personally witnessed the night table twist about 90 degrees and topple over. Herman's doubts about his son's guilt must have vanished then and there, for the boy was lying quietly in bed, looking badly frightened. During the rest of that week, Popper gave the Hermans little peace. On Tuesday, reporter from the London Evening News, proof in itself of how the poltergeist reputation was growing, was standing in the living room doorway. Suddenly he saw a photographer's flashbulb, which had been lying on an end table, sail across the entire room and pop to pieces against the opposite wall. A few minutes later, a box of Clorox was found in the cellar without its cap, its contents spilling. Jimmy was in the bathroom when one of the most destructive events of all took place. Everyone heard a resounding crash and rushing into the dining room found that the glass centerpiece had again smashed into the corner cabinet. This time it had broken off a scalped wooden portion of it. Minutes later a heavy bookcase in the cellar toppled over and so it went day after day for the whole week. Both of the parapsychologists who had been studying the manifestations for several days were present during the finale of the case. On Sunday, March 9th, when both children were in bed, one of the researchers and James Herman were talking in the dining room when both heard a cavernous thump from the direction of the boys' room. A search turned up nothing. Three quarters of an hour later, an even louder thump was heard by everyone. Again, nothing was found amiss. Later, the two researchers and Jimmy tried to duplicate the sound by striking various walls but they could never quite match the original tone qualities. On March 10th, a Monday evening, James Herman stayed in New York City to appear on a radio program, the first of several during which he and his family told of their unnerving experience. In so doing, he missed the last appearance of Popper, which occurred a few minutes after eight. Everyone was in the upper portion of the house when a loud thump was heard in the basement. It was found that once again, as perhaps befitting the nickname given the poltergeist. A bottle of bleach minus its unscrewed cap was emptying out its liquid on the cement floor. Jimmy's father soon relinquished his suspicions that Jimmy was responsible for the poltergeist activity. He had a new theory, and years after the events, he was quoted as still believing it. Herman had become convinced that a type of radio radiation from a submarine navigation station off the Atlantic coast had somehow caused the phenomena, but the two parapsychologists thought differently. Having ruled out fraud or hoax, psychological considerations and purely physical causes, they cautiously suggested that psychokinesis, that aspect of extrasensory perception, popularly known as mind over matter, may have been at work.